everybody in our uh, faculty of mechanical engineering uh, and mechatronics, uh, West Pomeranian University in Szczecin. Uh, my name is Mirosław Pajor, I am a dean of this faculty. Uh, today we have a pleasure to uh, uh, visit uh, Professor Jasper uh, Dupia from uh, Oakley, uh, University of Auckland uh, in New Zealand. Uh, let's welcome uh, uh, the professor with uh, applause. <laughs> professor Jasper Dupia is an expert in machine dynamics and control. Uh, his research uh, interest cover modeling, uh, estimation uh, and uh, control application uh, in the uh, context of uh, robotic and uh, mechatronic system. Uh, uh, she co co cooperate with a team group of Professor Bartosz Powałka in program, uh, in project in, from in the global program. I think uh, Professor Powałka uh, will say something about. Uh, Professor Jasprit uh, Dupia prepared for us very interesting uh, presentation entitled Improving Performance uh, and Reliability of Mechatronic System Using Modeling and Control Strategies. Uh, Mr. Professor, uh, thank you very much for your visit. I wish you interesting stay in Szczecin and uh, excellent cooperation with our uh, research center. Yeah, my pleasure. Thank you, Mr. Dean. Uh, welcome everybody once again. I would like to welcome those who came here for, for our lecture. These are our faculty members, our students, uh, PhD students from electrical faculty. Uh, I would like also to welcome the members of, uh, of uh, Szczecin branch of Polish Society of, uh, of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics. I would like also to welcome those who join us online. These are the members of mentioned just before uh, Polish, Polish uh, Society of Mechanical, of Theoretical and Applied Mechanics. Uh, I would like to welcome also our mutual friend, Ruven Katz, who is watching us from Haifa. Hello, Ruven. Uh, did I skip somebody? Oh, of course. I would like also to, to welcome uh, the members of uh, Polish Academy of Sciences, Machine Building Committee members. A short historical brief. We met with Jasprit in 2004 at University of Michigan, and we worked these days. Jasprit was a PhD student, and I was a postdoc uh, out there, and we were working under the supervision of Professor Ulsoy on machine tool dynamics. When our ways have split it, I came to Poland and Jasprit just began his travel all around the world. He moved to Singapore where he worked on uh, health monitoring issues. Then he moved to New Zealand, to Auckland University and as, as Dean has already mentioned, his interest switched a little bit towards robotics. Now, the, our ways uh, has have crossed again and we just we are just the beginning yesterday we have a kickoff meeting of our new project uh, the project is 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 gonna be performed is gonna be carried out with a partnership of uh, Andrychowska Fabrika Machine Andrychów Machine Tool Factory Jasprit is, a, is our partner and Jasprit will be responsible for implementation for developing algorithms for monitoring of a machine tool bearing system. Okay, so Jasprit, now it's your turn. Thanks so much for your kind introduction, both Mr. Dean and Professor Pawalka. Uh, it is a great honor to be here in Skychen in Poland. After a long pandemic, <clears throat> I'm very excited to come to the university and present this uh, uh, topic of mine in person and also to all the people who are listening to it through broadcast on YouTube. So I'm Jaspreet from uh, University of This talk is improving performance and reliability of mechatonic systems using modeling and control strategies. It's a very broad topic and it covers a lot of things in mechatonics, signal processing, 
mechanical electrical engineering. And very soon, I'll try to explain to you why I kept this topic so broad and uh, how it is related to my journey, a little bit of which Vartosh al already mentioned about. But before I start my uh, research topic, I want to do a little bit of advertising for my University of Auckland. This is, the, uh, this is our office building in the lovely city of Auckland, New Zealand. Now, New Zealand has, is blessed with a lot of natural beauty. Uh, it has many activities to do. So if you are interested into mountain climbing, or if you are interested in the beach, or if you are interested in skiing, or you want to enjoy good food, New Zealand has something for you. And uh, I think now is a good opportunity to visit. I just left a, a, a brochure on the side of the chairs. So you can collect one if you, uh, uh, whenever you get a chance while leaving the room. So you can see the conference that we are organizing in, uh, uh, in Auckland, New Zealand. It's the IEEE case, which is the premier conference for the IEEE Robotics and Automation Society. So our, the kind of research that we all do over here, it fits very well. So IEEE case is interested in uh, robotics, automation, management of industrial data, signal processing. These are the traditional things. And the special theme for the conference in, uh, in uh, uh, Auckland is the automation for resilient society. So as we are coming out of pandemic era, it's uh, more and more important that the technologies that we develop are resilient to the uh, challenges that are faced by the modern society. So University of Auckland is, uh, uh, has a long history and many uh, research centers, which are mentioned over here. And it's uh, established in 1883. It has several campuses, and we are mainly based in the city campus. Now, going to my uh, research journey. So Bartosz mentioned that uh, we know each other since uh, 2004, when we were looking at machine dynamics. And this was a new class of machine. We were looking at the reconfigurable uh, machine tool, which is uh, which is slightly different from the other machines that you see in industries, which are either built around a part or they are built in order to do many things on those machines. So, so this machine was built around the part family, and this particular one was to do the machining on the engine blocks that are found in GM, uh, GM automotive cars. So I was looking at the machine dynamics, and after I finished uh, my PhD, I moved over to Singapore, and in Singapore, I uh, partnered with ABB and Rolls-Royce and they were interested in rotating machines, looking at signals and dynamics uh, from rotating machines. I had a good long collaboration with National Renewable Energy Lab, which is still continuing. So National Renewable Energy Lab is operated by the Department of Energy of US, and it is interested in robustness and controls of the wind turbines. Okay, yep. Uh, so uh, just a... Uh, 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 just a note that I've been told, uh, if you're watching this, uh, if you're wa watching this seminar online on YouTube, please ask the questions on the chat. So feel free to put your questions on the chat at any time, and I'll be taking those questions uh, uh, at the end and in the middle of the seminar. Then finally, uh, after uh, finishing up uh, in 2015, uh, I moved from Singapore to New Zealand. And in New Zealand, I'm inside the Department of Mechanical and, Mechato uh, Mechanical and Mechatronics Department. And a lot of my colleagues are interested in building many different kind of robotic platforms. And these are some of the robotic platforms I worked on and I'll be presenting about today. But I'm interested in applying signal processing, control, dynamic uh, considerations, again, to make sure that these robotic platforms are able to work reliably and in a deterministic manner. So this talk is really an introduction. It tries to cover a little bit of my journey through the entire uh, 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 career. And the way I have tried to divide this talk is by covering a few examples of uh, uh, my projects in robotics and some examples of projects in the fault monitoring and identification. So let's start with the project in robotics. And in order to look at the project in robotics, let's look at the challenge that we are facing. So as I mentioned that uh, my group is basically developing different robotic platforms. The inspiration is mainly coming from uh, different biomechanical processes, uh, uh, biological, uh, uh, either biological processes which are happening 
in humans or in animals, or in order to understand something which happens in biology, but we want to build a platform that, rep that can replicate the process uh, uh, that happens within an organism. So the issue that we are facing is that when we build these platforms, they're often working with soft material. Uh, inherently, we have to, when we work with biological processes, inherently we end up having some soft material, and these tend to have high strain, high deformations. How do you come up with repeatability and deterministic process? This is also uh, some of the key challenges in traditional robotics and many of the things that many other groups have worked on with traditional robotics also. So we will be looking at uh, the same issues in soft robotics. And just an example of some famous soft robots are shown over there about grasping and the soft fish which is built by the MIT research group. Now I will be considering these three uh, robots that we have built and the first one that I'll consider is the linkage chewing robot. So let's start with the description of how this is built and how this is controlled and what it does. So the challenges that we put forward for our research are coming up with modeling of the robots and understanding the dynamics in presence of soft materials or uh, soft structure. We have the challenges that the soft deformable surface basically results in a highly nonlinear interaction forces. And we have to develop control strategies in order to ensure that the uh, task can be repeated uh, uh, efficiently in different cycles. So the linkage chewing robot is shown on the, uh, uh, shown on the left. And what it is trying to do is shown in the middle through the animation. So in the dentistry, uh, uh, the uh, chewing trajectory is already measured and reported in the, dental, in the dental journals. So in the dental journals, they describe that as we are chewing, if you consider every chewing cycle, which is uh, the teeth going down and moving up in a cyclic fashion, it roughly looks like the trajectory which is shown on the animation over here. But the challenge is that as the food material changes, so we, we begin with ingesting the food material, and we crush the food material, and then we try to break it into even finer particles to make it safe to swallow. So this trajectory actually changes a little bit from cycle to cycle. In the beginning, we have a more vertical displacement, which tries to put more compression, whereas towards the end of the chewing, which is we roughly chew for like 20 to uh, 50 cycles, so within that, towards the end, we are having a more lateral trajectory where we are trying to uh, crush the food particles between our teeth and grind them into even smaller pieces. So if we look at a single trajectory, a single trajectory can be recreated by a four-bar linkage mechanism. And what I have shown over here is a modified four-bar linkage mechanism, which I'll describe in the next slide. But apart from that modified four-bar linkage mechanism, we have also included a oral cavity or a, a food repositioning system, which is made with soft material and pneumatically actuated. We have included the denture molars, and we have uh, uh, kept a load cell between, below the denture molars, below the lower molar, so that we can measure the chewing forces and get some meaningful analysis out of this machine. So I mentioned this is a modified four-bar linkage mechanism. So if you look at this uh, uh, schematic, you can actually see that the robot has three degrees of freedom. It has the crank for providing the continuous rotation, it has a crank for providing the continuous rotation. It has a link which can be moved, uh, a four bar linkage whose ground length can be moved using the D5 degree of freedom. And then I call this as a passive degree of freedom because the only purpose of this ball, ball bearing and linear, uh, linear actuation is to keep the lower teeth aligned with the upper, upper molar teeth. So we call that this is a two degree of freedom plus one passive degree of freedom because we are just aligning the two teeth. And the top structure is able to recreate all these different kind of molar trajectories. And these molar trajectories are, re are reconstructed in a way that it, it, it matches with the experimental data reported in the dental literatures. So you can see that these dental, the, these trajectories can have a larger vertical displacement which provide more compression or larger uh, lateral displacement which provide more shearing effect. 
This is the animation, uh, this is the video of my student demonstrating the operation of the robot. So you can see that uh, uh, on the top, he's showing the uh, 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 molar trajectories. In the video over here, he will demonstrate the chewing of the peanuts. Also, we have a graphical user interface, which is built using National Instruments LabVIEW, which can measure the chewing forces, and later on, this data can be collected for further analysis. And this is the control panel, which basically describes how we can sequence the trajectories. So, so the trajectories are already inbuilt in the uh, programmed inside the software. We can choose how we want to run the trajectories one after another, provide that sequence in, in, the, lab, uh, in the lab view, and then the uh, uh, motion planning will be carried out by the software, and it will run those trajectories one after another and execute the entire chewing cycle. This robot got uh, 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 caught, caught the interest of the uh, uh, Food and Drug Administration of US, and they approached us if we could run, a pro if, if we could run one of the projects for them on this robot. They were interested in understanding how much drug is released from the opioid drugs under the abuse deterrent formulations. So the abuse deterrent formulations are new class of opioid drugs where you have physical or chemical barriers within the drug tablet to prevent the release, sudden release of the drug component. So, so by having these physical and chemical barriers, you ensure that the drug is released slowly in order to have the medical benefit and to prevent the addiction to the drugs because these drugs tend to be highly addictive. And we were asked to test four market products, so we are testing these four market products, and we enhanced this uh, robot in order to have the artificial saliva that could flow inside the uh, oral cavity chamber, and we uh, basically did this biomimicking chewing on the drugs. After that, we did uh, the dissolution test, and we saw how much the uh, drug gets released over an entire day, and we found that the results that we got from our tests were very different from those which are reported in the journals. So the current, current best practice by the drug manufacturers is just to ca carry out the dissolution test. So, so we found that somehow the bio, biological chewing process enhances the capability of uh, uh, how much drug can be extracted out of the, uh, out of the tablets. So that covers the linkage chewing robot. Now we will cover another kind of chewing robot which is the redundantly actuated parallel chewing robot. Now this robot is built with a slightly different purpose. The previous, the previous robot was essentially a masticator and it was used for food texture analysis and has been used to understand medical tablets. This robot has been built in order to understand the biological process that, uh, that creates the chewing. And it's built around the way our jaw is constructed. So our jaw is basically our lower jaw is held to our skull by six muscles. These six muscles are the six actuators which are actuating the movement of the jaw with respect to the skull. And this is, uh, this is uh, uh, modeled over here using th six actuators, which are these motors, which are these black cylindrical objects, which are connected with the crank. And the crank is basically the upper uh, fixed structure of the robot which is connected to the lower jaw, which is connected to the lower mandible and actuating the lower jaw. Now, six motors should result in six actuators degree of freedom, which means that we should be able to align our jaw in anywhere in the space, but that doesn't happen. The reason that it, we can't align our jaw any, any, in any direction in the space is because of the constraints that we have between the skull and the lower jaw. So that happens because our skull is uh, having a curved surface, and the lower jaw is having a very complex joint, which is the temporal mandibular joint, and this joint is often referred in the uh, 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 medical journals as the most complex joint in the, in the human anatomy. The reason it is so, uh, considered complex is because we don't only have a connection along an axis, but we have a sliding also which is happening along this jaw, uh, along, along this joint. So this is the only joint in the human body where you have uh, both a rotation as well as a sliding motion happening uh, between, two, between two connecting bones. So this temporal mandibular joint is modeled using these curved slots along with the ball, ball portions. And these ball portions are connected 
through the structure, and we have, uh, we have sensorized them using strain gauges, so we can actually measure the reaction forces that, uh, that happen in the temporal mandibular joints. And this is of medical importance, because often when we f uh, feel the pain in our jaws, or if, if there's a serious uh, issue with our, uh, 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 our uh, skull uh, pains in the cheeks and nausea, that, that is usually happening because of the uh, uh, because of defects in the temporal mandibular joint, and we want to understand how the human chewing how, how the human chewing changes when when people suffer from uh, defects in temporal mandibular joints. In order to understand how the robot moves, we use the Lagrangian mechanics in order to build the equation of motions for the robot. So the way we build the Lagrangian equation of the motion, we end up getting the inputs, which are the torques applied on all the motors, and the outputs are basically the uh, orientation of the uh, orientation of the lower mandible. And the lower mandible, as I described, because we have two constraining uh, joints, so we have six six actuators, two constraining joints, so we have only four four actuators. So what we end up having is four independent equations, but we have six inputs that can be applied to this robot because of extra actuators. So that's why it is redundant, redundantly actuated. Now we need to come up with, uh, uh, this is an indeterminate problem, so it has infinite solutions. Now we want to understand which of those solutions are most relevant to our field of investigation. And what we wish to investigate is how we chew. So we basically create a cost function in which we minimize the Euclidean norm of the actuating torques. So the Euclidean, when we minimize the Euclidean norm of the actuating torques, it, it is, uh, it is similar to minimizing the power that is used in order to operate this machine. And by doing that, we are finding the most efficient way of chewing, and we, are hypothesize, we hypothesize, hypothesize that uh, this efficient way of chewing is similar to how the healthy human beings chew, chew the food material. The other cost function that we created is by minimizing the loads, the reaction forces on the uh, robot's TMJ. And this is similar to when somebody is suffering from TMJ pain, he probably is trying to minimize the forces, the reaction forces that, that happen on that side of the jaw. So that cost function is representing some, some, some patient who has the dental, uh, uh, dental problems. In order to come up with the input, we developed this uh, motion capturing system. So the motion capturing system was built using two webcams and we use the Aruko markers, uh, which are basically these uh, markers that we can print on the paper and stick to the piece of cardboard. And this can be, one, one was fixed to the skull, while the other one, uh, we had two Aruko markers in order to get all the three axes, uh, 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 the, the displacement and the orientation in all the three axes accurately. And we created two perpendicular surfaces which were connected to a wire, and that was connected to a denture, which was connected to the lower jaw. So the two webcams traced this uh, uh, lower Aruko marker, subtracted the uh, displacement of the skull in order to find out the relative displacement of the lower jaw with respect to the skull. Now this was uh, checked against the Wicon system. So Wicon system is the uh, large motion capturing system, which is installed in an entire special room with several cameras and cost around $100,000 in order to set up the system. And we found that there was no bias within one uh, reading or another, which, which showed that uh, this system is performing as well as the Wicon system can perform. So once we found the trajectories, we used the inverse kinematics in order to determine what, was the, what should be the input that should be applied to each of the motors. So within each of the motors, we applied the reference trajectories we use PD controller in the forward path, but when we just applied PD control uh, that comes along with the motors, we found that uh, the accuracy wasn't that good. So in order to improve that, it was obviously coming because of the modeling inaccuracies and because of the friction and because of the interaction with the molars with each other. So we created a disturbance accommodating uh, controller. So in order to create a disturbance accommodating controller, we have the disturbance which we assume is acting on the system, but this disturbance is modeled through a set of differential equations where we assume some properties of uh, the disturbance. Either it is a constant or it is a, 
uh, rising or falling, but it, can, it doesn't need to be exactly the same. This is just a rough assumption. And we then try to recreate those at every time step and feed it back into the forward path so that these, this disturbance cancels out with the disturbance which is acting on the system. So after that, we got a performance which looks like this, where we are basically recreating the same trajectory that my student measured on himself using the Aruko system. And on this, you can see that the uh, uh, chewing gum is on the left side. And you can see that while the chewing happens, we can see that the forces are shown, uh, reaction forces are shown on the right TMJ and the left TMJ. And the left TMJ forces are much higher, which is because the chewing is happening on the left side of the, uh, of the robot. So this covers two robots which are built around the biological process, and they are usually built to interact with the soft material or material that has high strain, uh, highly nonlinear behavior. The last uh, platform I want to describe is a soft surface manipulator, and this is built using soft material, and it is meant to uh, uh, manipulate delicate objects that may be placed on the surface, and you can place a lot of delicate objects and it can uh, handle those. So the idea for the robot was built around the uh, uh, motion of the caterpillar. So caterpillar basically uh, has different sections in its body. And the way it uh, uh, moves forward is that it pushes some of the uh, uh, appendages uh, out of the body. And that creates a lateral wave on the, uh, uh, on the lower side of the caterpillar, which, which moves along the entire body. and that transfers the, uh, that, that moves a caterpillar forward. So we just inverted that uh, system. So we assume that uh, the soft structure is actually the surface. So we built this actuator. So we built this by building an array of uh, actuators. So this is a grid. So you can see over here, five by five grid, which is 20 actuators. In this case, we built each actuator, which is this small square. Each actuator has four pneumatic chambers. And we only actuate two chambers at a time. So when we actuate two chambers at a time, they come out of the body. But because the other actuators are empty, the other, the other chambers are empty, not only do they come out, but they also have a small lateral displacement as they come out, because the other, other chambers will contract. And this lateral, uh, uh, lateral displacement is what creates a wave on the su surface manipulator that that handles the object and moves the object from one location to another location. The control system is based on a vision-based sensing. So there is a camera which is, uh, which is able to look at the uh, uh, location of the object. It, it, uh, it basically sends it to the host PC where, uh, where some image processing is carried out. There, there are two purposes of this sensing. First of all, we want to find out which actuators the object is uh, uh, occupying. And the second is that once we know its current orientation and we know what is the reference direction, that reference value that we want to take it to, we know what kind of uh, actuation command should be sent to the uh, correct actuators. So this part is done through the P host PC. And then the low-level controller sends the commands, which basically uh, regulates the pressure uh, 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 pressure through each of the walls, and that uh, decides how much of the uh, gas should go inside in order to create a certain amount of displacement on the, on the surface. So here is the uh, 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 manipulation of the uh, object going on. So you can see on the screen that on your left, on the top, uh, there are dashed blue lines. So this is the plus minus five millimeter band around the reference value. The reference value is the uh, the reference value is the uh, is the uh, I think the black curve in the uh, uh, center, and the red curve that you see is the uh, the red curve that you see is the uh, give me a second. Okay, so th there is a video, so you can see actually the. Uh, uh, object moving on the surface. So the red curve that you see is the uh, uh, actual, uh, actual trajectory that the object takes. And you can see from the error plots that the error remain within the plus minus five millimeters, which is considered to be a good 
kind of accuracy for this class of robots, which are quite cheap to build. And these are basically just built by uh, making a 3D mold using a 3D printer and then fill, filling it up with some polymer and uh, recreating it in the student lab. So, so these kind of robots are much cheaper and five millimeter accuracy is considered as a good benchmark for these kind of, uh, this class of robots. So <clears throat> this covers the examples of my robotic projects and I showed to you that robotic uh, designs that we have carried out in our, in our lab are task specific and these are guided by some physical nature or some biomechanical process. We carried out the dynamic modeling and control strategies for these mechanisms. And I presented to you three robotic platforms, which involved uh, interactions with soft material, which had high strain, large deformations. And for these, we showed how we can develop, uh, we can do the dynamic modeling and uh, develop control strategies in order to have a desirable uh, close loop performance. The next, uh, I'll start with the projects in fault monitoring and identification. But I think this is a good time to take a pause. And uh, uh, if you have any questions, I can answer them right now and then go into the examples in the fault monitoring and identification. Thank you for this part. If there are any questions, we can take that. And otherwise, we can just continue. Don't be afraid. I ask questions. Uh, I didn't understand how the table works. Can, could you uh, yes. try to explain it? Yeah, step, step by step. step. Yes. Yeah, step by step. <coughs> the small uh, square parts, how do yeah. they move? Yeah. So, so every now and then you will see that some of these actuators, which are with the objects, they get, uh, uh, you can see some black part which is rising out of them. Uh, it happened once over in the beginning. So generally, each of the square that you are seeing is a, is a pneumatic actuator which is filled up, which is having four chambers. So, so they are, they, uh, e each, each actuator is basically having two walls perpendicular to each other, and it, it is divided into four small chambers. And each of those chambers is having a separate pneumatic line which is coming inside, so, so they can be regulated independently. So if I uh, uh, add air into two of the chambers, those two chambers will come out. The material is quite soft. But while coming out, because there's no air on the side, the, others, the other chambers are also going to contract because, because not only will it come out, but it will also expand along the sides. And because of that uh, expansion in the side, it will ha the peak point will not exactly be at the center, but it will have a small vertical displacement, small uh, horizontal displacement also. So that horizontal displacement interacts with the objects and moves, moves the object from one location to another. So the second one is just a flat, yeah? So the one is coming out? Yes. yes. And the other is staying in the same uh, position? Not exactly the same location. Because there's nothing, it will contract a little bit. Yeah, and, and that, that, that causes, causes the displacement. Some more questions? Oh, I have another question. Uh, I don't like the concept of the cost function uh, that we're minimizing the torque. I think it's justified from the evolutionary point of view. Yep. Uh, was it supported by some biological studies? Or yeah, because the uh, because the uh, Euclidean norm of the torque it's related to the energy that is used up by the system, so uh, uh, it's basically the uh, total energy consumption. It's proportional to the total energy consumption, and by minimizing that, we are minimizing the total energy consumption of the robot. So we are just hypothesizing that since we are since humans have learned the chewing for all their life, inherently we have. Uh, figured out how to chew things using the minimum energy without causing too much fatigue to our muscles. And I have another question. Uh, it's about those uh, disturbances in the model. Uh, what was the source of them? So, 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 the, source is, so, so the source of this is uh, coming from the modeling uncertainties and the friction. Now, this friction may arise either from the joints 
or it may arise from the end effector through the interaction of the uh, interaction with the uh, chewing gum in this particular case. But we assume that all these disturbances are just lumped together at the uh, at the servo level because this this control loop is being applied at the servo at the servo level. So so. Uh, uh, we just lump all the disturbances as an unknown value at the servo loop and then uh, estimate the value for that and, and try to compensate for it. Like a distribution of uh, part of uh, chewing force or something like this? <coughs> so, uh, no, okay. you, uh, chewing normal force is not a good way uh, to describe them. Uh, generally, what happens is that uh, uh, the theory is coming from uh, uh, modeling of persistent disturbances. So, the differential equations are set up. Uh, uh, by assuming that it is a constant, which means the derivative is going to be zero, or it is a uh, ramp function, which means that uh, uh, it will be a rising, uh, well, it, the derivative will be equal to some constant. So these, these differential equations are modeled as an estimator, and we try to estimate those disturbances. But, but an estimator can change from time to time. So if we provide it a constant disturbance, if the disturbance is actually con constant, we will have zero steady state error. But if the disturbances tend to be different, we still see improvement in performance, just that uh, uh, we don't get zero steady state error, but some smaller, smaller errors. Okay. Pavel? The of uh, modern trajectory of any uh, body movement uh, requires the proper uh, modeling of friction in the joint connection. Uh, yes. Can you uh, tell me which models of friction do you use and uh, yeah. why? Yeah, so, 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 so in this one we haven't used uh, detailed modeling of the friction. We have, we have just used a rough estimation and as I described that we don't get a zero steady state error. Of course if you, if you want to become more and more precise uh, we, we need to come up with a better frictional model and we have to incorporate those models. The controller can only work as good as you, as you model the system. But, uh, but in this case, because with the biological processes, there's anyway a lot of uncertainty from one, one step to another step. So we are not trying to solve everything. We're just trying to come up with a, with a good enough performance where we can recreate uh, how things happen in reality. And once we are able to get a good performance out of uh, our robot, uh, we have not put our, uh, we have not so far put our effort into modeling further than that. And I have a question regarding your first robot that you presented and this FDA-based project. Uh, you showed the list of the medicines that you were testing. These are pills? Yeah, these are opioid uh, pills. So these are basically based on the morphine compound. And uh, you might have heard about uh, 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 especially in U.S. newspapers, there is an epidemic reported about people. Every, every few days, some famous person dies because they overdose on some medicines. So what happens is that these opioids are prescribed for relieving pain, for uh, uh, helping terminal, uh, terminally ill patients, and so on. But they get abused by some of the people. And, and, uh, and these are basically the drugs we are trying to see and make sure that they don't uh, we are trying to characterize how the brand name drugs are uh, releasing the drugs, and the purpose for FDA is that how do we how do how do they set up the policy for the generic drug makers? Okay, the question is how do you perform the test? So in details, you put the pills into this robot. <coughs> yes, it is chewing that that pill. Yes, then you put some saliva into it and. Yeah. It drops to this, to this chamber? So, so first of all, we create a design of uh, experiment-based grid. So the design of experiments, we basically choose based on the uh, uh, physically relevant conditions. We choose the saliva rate. We choose the different trajectories. We choose uh, uh, what is the chewing forces, whether we want to apply high chewing force or less chewing force. Based on that, we create all the different operating conditions. We test the drugs. Uh, in a repeated manner. For each of the tests that we conduct, we collect the saliva and, uh, the saliva and uh, uh, whatever is inside the chamber, the broken pieces. We put them into a dissolution test. So the dissolution test is basically uh, a solvent. It's out of the robot. Yeah, it's out of the robot. It's just water, distilled water. And it's basically just a stirrer that continues stirring the mixture for 24 hours. 
And we take it at regular intervals, uh, put it in the UV spectrometer in order to calculate what is the amount of drug that okay. is released okay. at these different, uh, from these different samples. Okay, thank you. Are there any questions? Pavel, are there any questions from, from internet? No, so we may turn to this, to the second stage of your presentation. Yep, thanks so much. <coughs> okay, so uh, with this, let's uh, look at a few examples of fault monitoring and identification. And again, the uh, uh, general purpose is what I put in my title of the presentation, that I want to improve the robustness of the process of how we apply these techniques, considering practical uh, real-life conditions, what are the, and, and, and considering what are the challenges of uh, applying traditional methods of signal processing for fault identification with real-world measurements. So generally, uh, the main issue with uh, spectral-based analysis is that Let's say we are seeing some kind of a failure in a gear or a bearing. So let's say if we see a fault in a gear or a bearing in lab, they often will simulate it by uh, creating a fault on the inner or the outer race. And they will test it uh, under control conditions. And if everything is perfect, there is no noise, there is no uh, uh, fluctuation in the speed, we will expect to see some fault characteristic frequencies. So these F, FCF are uh, the frequency, are the magnitudes, are the high, high amplitudes at certain frequencies, which is, which is uh, indicating some kind of force, fault in the, in the machinery. Now these uh, sp spectral frequency components will happen at uh, regular harmonics. And by looking at these and look, uh, looking at where these uh, peaks happen, we can determine which, which kind of fault has happened. But that really happens in practice. Because when we apply, when we look at the machinery in practice, usually these machineries are always operated under speed fluctuations. And under the speed fluctuations, what we end up having is a spectral smearing. And with the noise, it, uh, uh, it becomes even more difficult to uh, uh, look at these frequency points from the spectral graph. So everything is smeared, and it's difficult to identify the faults in practical machinery. Now, there's a lot of research which is done. There's order tracking, which requires use of additional sensors, but these additional sensors are not usually available in the uh, industrial machinery. And there are also time frequency uh, analysis. You can, you, you can create a time frequency plot, but towards the end of the presentation, I'll describe some challenges with the, with the time frequency plots also. So looking at this uh, uh, fluctuation in a practical machinery, so I mentioned that in the beginning that I collaborated with National Renewable Energy Lab. And this is a wind turbine, a 750 kilowatt wind turbine, which is operated in Golden, Colorado by the National Renewable Energy Lab. Under these conditions, when the wind speed is large, uh, the turbine is trying to operate at its maximum power. The way it runs at its maximum power is by, uh, by controller trying to keep the speed of the rotor constant. So no matter what is the incoming rotor speed, it tries to adjust the blades in a way that the rotor speed does not change. But even after having such a large inertia of the turbine and, having, uh, and the controller doing its job, we can see that the speed fluctuates from, the, from almost 21.6 to 23 RPM, which is around 15 to 20% of peak-to-peak -peak fluctuation. Now, if I put this peak-to-peak -peak fluctuation in a simulation of 15 to 20%, so this is just describing a simulation for two gears meshing with each other, where the blue line is the healthy gearbox, and the red line is creating a simulation for a gearbox with having a broken teeth. But we can see that both these simulations, you can see that uh, we can't really see the peaks anymore. So the meshing frequency has smeared out, and the sidebands which indicate the presence of fault should appear at 90 hertz and 110 hertz. We can see the small variation over there, but it's really difficult to identify the fault from these kind of uh, plots. Now, we took an approach from computer science literature, which is dynamic time warping. And this dynamic time warping approach is built based on uh, 
uh, trying to see how similar two, two signals are. If we look at the top left plot, we have two signals, and we can see that the difference between these two signals, they have some minor differences, but the main difference is that one of the signals seems to be stretched, so the red signal seems to be a blue, similar to blue signal, but it is stretched in the initial portion, and then at the later time, it seems to be compressed. So there's a nonlinear stretching and compression of the signals. And we say that this kind of, the speed fluctuations result in something similar. So, so we, when we try to run the machinery, it may fluctuate uh, by having a higher speed or lower speed around the nominal condition uh, at different time instants, and we see a similar stretching and compression in the signals uh, 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 for, for measurement and reference, what we, what we expect the reference to be. So in order to come up with this uh, best fit between the two signals, so in order to come up with the best fit by doing this nonlinear elongation and compression, which is shown in the plot below, we create this cost matrix. So the cost matrix is built by having the reference signal along one of the x's. So in this case, the reference signal is the x value in the vertical direction. And then the measurements which are collected at different samples of point, we basically collect them at, uh, uh, along the other x's. And each of the matrix data point is built by having the Euclidean distance between the measurement and the reference. So the first matrix value will basically be the difference between this value and this value and taking a square of it. The second uh, matrix value, which is over here, uh, having the index 1, 2, will be the second value on the measurement and the first value along the reference. So we end up building the entire bottom row in this way. And similarly, we can build the second row, third row, and so on. Of course, the computation will be very, far, very large because we have to do a lot of computation. So we developed a faster way of solving the entire algorithm. But, but uh, because of the lack of time, I won't go into the details, but just limit myself to how the DTW works. So, uh, so once we build this matrix, now we have to find out the warp path. So the rules of finding the warp path is that we start from the index 1, 1. We have to end our warp path at index n, n. And we can only increase each index either by 1, in, which will take us to the right or top if we, uh, increase the index, uh, in, if we increase the other index. Or if we increase both indices by 1, then we end up going diagonally top, top right. So by finding out this swap path, we end up getting a transformation path which allows us to transform this measurement signal to the reference signal. And this reference signal is assumed at a constant speed. So essentially, we have transformed the time axis to a, uh, uh, to a constant speed axis. And we have been able to carry out the order tracking for this particular uh, uh, analysis. We verified this by building, uh, we verified this on a setup that we built in our lab. So this is a motor gearbox load cell setup. And this has a lot more capabilities and can do a lot more other things besides just uh, doing the experiment that I'll show you next. So we have, uh, we have a motor. We can put different kind of gearboxes with faults inside them or open it and, and introduce faults. We have a generator and the generator is pivoted along a uh, central axis, and it presses on the load cell. So by pressing on the load cell, we are able to calculate what is the torque which is being transmitted through the uh, system, and we can find out the load. We also have encoders and other things, and inside the cabinet, we have a regenerative drive. So we are able to, we are able to, the generator produces electricity, but this electricity can be sent back to the motor in order to in order to drive the motor, so we don't have to take all the power from the grid. Uh, we create faults by th the example over here, where we uh, use EDM in order to uh, uh, create a fault on the ring gear. And we test it inside our, uh, we test two gearboxes, a healthy and a faulty gearbox. So this shows a spectral analysis where, where we would like to do the sidebands and see whether there is a failure or not. You can see that we never see the meshing frequency clearly, and we do not see any sidebands that indicate the presence of failure. But if you look at the uh, uh, residual plot, 
So basically, just the Euclidean distance between the uh, uh, between the uh, healthy and the faulty uh, systems with the reference. So you can see that if we do not do any dynamic time warping, we can't really see any statistical difference between the residual signal that we obtain from the healthy or the faulty gearbox. But once we apply the dynamic time warping, we can see that the residual signal for the uh, healthy case is quite low. And for the faulty case, we see a much larger residual signal, which can be analyzed further to determine what kind of fault is, is inside the system. This method that I described is applicable to both detecting gear faults as well as bearing faults. So this is a measurement that is taken from a two megawatt wind turbine, which was operating for 50 days. For each of the day, they collected one hour of signal. And after 50 days, the turbine naturally uh, was taken out of commission. They found, that, uh, they found that the bearing was getting too hot, so they had to stop the operation and, and take, it out of the, uh, take it out of commission. The fault that they found was inside the main bearing for the uh, shaft. So this was the bearing which is at the front of the wind turbine where the rotor, rotor of the wind turbine connects with the shaft and it is supported over there. So this bearing fault basically uh, uh, induced certain fault characteristic frequencies. The fault characteristic frequencies and the harmonics are marked over here. And you can see over here is a plot that is shown from the uh, from before applying the dynamic time warping and after applying the dynamic time warping analysis, we can see that the peaks are much larger in magnitude if we apply the dynamic time warping. This is because the energy is being squeezed into the fault characteristic frequencies. So the magnitude has become much larger, the noise band has become much smaller, and that makes the fault identification much more easier and uh, we can carry it out uh, more uh, more reliably. We are interested also in how to uh, uh, assist the users in, uh, in doing this, applying this algorithm uh, reliably. So one of the main challenge in many spectral analysis, uh, 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 many spectral analysis uh, uh, algorithms is that we need to pre-process the data. So the pre-processing of the data is by looking at the raw signal Trying to, uh, uh, trying to understand where the key frequency components are, and then uh, selecting a band pass filter at the correct central frequency and with the correct band. Now this takes a lot of experience, and it also takes a lot of information about how the system is operating. So what we, want, what we are trying to do is we are, we are developing a numerical approach where we use the adaptive mode decomposition, which is sim similar to empirical mode decomposition, so what it does is that it takes look, looks at the signal, it just applies some, uh, it just looks at the peaks and the troughs of the signal consecutively, subtracts some signal value, but it tries to come up with a, uh, different modes of the signal, and then we find that for our case, we find one particular mode to have the information of the speed fluctuation. So we can use that, that mode in order to recreate the speed fluctuation information, find out the warp path from that, from that mode, and then apply it, the warp path in order to find out, in order to process the signal, uh, do the order tracking, and come up with a clean spectrum, which is shown over here. If I did not apply this approach, I will end up having a smear spectrum, which is shown on the top, top right of the slide. Now, the, my final part of the presentation will go into some of the newer approaches, uh, which is like the deep learning, neural network ways of how we can apply for, uh, how we can use the deep learning neural networks in order to carry out condition monitoring. My interest remains the same. I want to understand that how we can apply this deep learning neural network in order to reliably and robustly uh, uh, detect the, uh, detect the uh, presence of faults. Now, my interaction with industry shows that many, industry mem many of the industrial members are very uh, hesitant to apply neural networks because there's no explanation of how the uh, neural networks operate. That's one thing. And also they find that its uh, accuracy is not as, as good that they need in order, to have, in order to comply with the industrial standards. So what we are trying to do is we are trying to have a neural network system which does provide us information of uh, uh, health classification, trying to tell us whether the system is healthy or faulty. But we are also using 
neural networks, so, so even after the neural network says that there is a healthy and faulty, most companies still need a person to sign off and say that, okay, we need an extensive, re extensive repair. For example, if a wind turbine, offshore wind turbine is faulty, somebody has to sign off by saying that, yes, there is actually a fault, and uh, in, order to take, uh, in order to repair the fault, an expensive maintenance mission should be taken in order to transfer the drivetrain components and, and uh, replace those in an offshore, offshore turbine. So in order to provide that assistance, we are using uh, an image enhancement technique which is based on the adversarial neural networks of improving the time frequency plots. And I'll explain to you in a minute what, what it is doing. So there are two things that I will describe to you in the next few slides. One is how to classify the faults reliably, and then I will explain to you how we can enhance the time frequency plots in order to provide user and assistance in identifying that these faults are actually present in the system. So let's look at the classification of the faults. So we are using, uh, again we are using the, uh, again we are using the measured signal. We convert them into the time frequency plots, and these time frequency plots that we get from measurements, they look kind of noisy, and I'll explain soon about why they are noisy. So they don't really look like a clear plot with clear sidebands uh, uh, that are often taught in the textbook. We use AlexNet. AlexNet is a very large neural network which is, which is trained on millions of images which are available on the internet. So this, this, this uh, neural network, which can be downloaded for MATLAB or for uh, Python using GitHub, is, uh, is trained to identify things like cats, dogs, mugs, chair, et cetera. The neural network construction is built up with eight layers, where the uh, first five layers are referred as the convolution neural networks, which are the networks used for image classification. And then the, it is followed by uh, uh, three layers, which are referred as the fully connected layers, where you use more information across the images, uh, image space. We replace this last fully connected layer with our own layer. So we, we take away from the GitHub, the, we take the code, we replace the last fully connected layer and replace it with our own network. And then we train it on 1,440 samples taken from the experiments. And we train this uh, to identify whether the bearing is healthy or whether it has a fault in the inner race or whether it has a fault in the outer race. So this uh, bearing data set, uh, because we are only using 1,440 samples because of the limited amount of information, if we built a convolution neural network from the scratch, having a similar architecture, we would not be able to get more than 33% accuracy in the classification. But because we used a transfer learning approach where we used a neural network which was used to do something else, but then we trained, we modified that neural network to learn our, uh, our images and uh, classify them into healthy, faulty inner, faulty outer. We are able to get 97% accuracy by using a very small training data set of just 1,440 samples. So that is one way of improving the reliability of uh, uh, the accuracy that you get from the neural networks. Now the next one is showing how we can assist the users in order to identify faults because this one classifies, but it does not give you any explanation. Somebody has to look at the time frequency plot and say that there is actually a, a fault. Now, he will be given a time frequency plot which looks like this. But if you look at the textbooks, the textbooks show the wavelets and the time frequency plots where you have some kind of a, uh, let's say for a gear fault, you have a central meshing frequency and then you have some sidebands. And these sidebands are changing at frequency values over different time. And this is happening because of the speed fluctuations in the, uh, in the operation. So, so this is the ideal image, but this is what we get in reality. The reason we get this kind of image in reality is because, first of all, the Heisenberg uncertainty principle, which says that you can never get enough resolution in the time and the frequency, both of them. So if you try to increase the, if you try to capture more uh, changes over a shorter period of time, you need to create a wavelet which is uh, more narrower, but then you don't have enough resolution. And the other thing is that 
we have a limited resolution anyway when we, when we look at the industrial machinery. And on top of it, we have the noise which is coming from other processes. So all this makes, makes the time frequency, real time frequency plots very difficult to analyze and, and identify. So what we do is we use a, a generative neural network uh, structure. Now, generative neural networks are a lot in the news these days. You might have heard about chat GPT. So many universities are worried that the students can cheat on their examinations because they can give their exam questions to chat GPT and it prints a nice essay and, and it provides the entire essay very well. So these are generative neural networks. The earliest generative neural networks were the ones which were creating fake images and videos. But these new uh, neural networks, what we are trying to do is we are trying to come up with a uh, generator. So it takes an input from, uh, it takes an input, and then that generates the, uh, uh, some image, and we compare it with a real image, and there is a discriminator which tries to classify whether, whether the image that the generator has uh, generated is, is a real image or not. So if it does not generate uh, close enough to a real image, then it uh, imposes a penalty which, which causes the generator to update its weights and generate a new image. And we do it repeatedly over many, many simulated samples in order, in order to train this uh, GAN system, in order to be able to take this input and be able to generate this idle time frequency plot. So here is the result on the two megawatt turbine. So I described earlier that the two megawatt turbine was operated for 50 days. And in the 50 days, we, it was taken out of the commission because the bearing was overheating. So you can see over here on the, uh, on the top right, you can see the actual time frequency plot over the entire range in the faulty conditions. And we are basically looking, it's difficult to uh, uh, see those uh, uh, sidebands, but they're roughly at 284 hertz and 568 hertz where the bearing defects uh, fall, characteristic, fall characteristic frequencies are lying. And we are trying to understand the uh, uh, characteristics in that region. So in the, in the other plots, I'm just showing you the magnified view of that section. So on the left are the uh, time frequency plots which are generated using the wavelets. And they are not good enough, so we send them to the CGAN. And then the CGAN spits out the uh, plots on the, on the right. So you can see on the day five, you don't really see any frequency component because the fault is either too early or it hasn't started developing. But around day 15, we see, start seeing something, uh, some of the sidebands appearing. And then you can see that as the time goes by, uh, the sidebands become more and more clearer which is indicating a larger magnitude of the uh, larger magnitude at those sidebands, larger energy magnitude at those sidebands, and describe and indicating that the fault severity is increasing with time. So that finishes my uh, presentation. In this presentation, I describe that modeling uncertainties, varying speed, and torque fluctuations, stochastic disturbances affect the operation of the practical industrial machinery. I presented to you the dynamic time warping to extract the fault information from fluctuating conditions. I also presented to you the deep transfer learning method to classify failures and uh, presented the conditional GAN, uh, conditional generative adversarial neural network, which is able to take in the time frequency plot, uh, practical time frequency plot, and generate an ideal time frequency plot, which allows us to easily identify failures and assist in predictive maintenance. So with that, uh, I want to acknowledge all the people who participated in the research with me, uh, my colleagues. Uh, some of them uh, built the robotic platforms on which I carried out further research that I presented here. Uh, the students who did most of the work, uh, the collaborators who often uh, helped me with parts of algorithms or who helped with uh, 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 better understanding. The uh, funding agencies which provided the uh, support uh, and enabled the research to happen. So I finally want to thank, uh, uh, I wa finally want to uh, show you the beautiful picture of Auckland again, hoping that uh, the collaboration that I initiate over here will continue for a long time and 
I'll also see you. I'll, I'll motivate you to take the long flights that I took. So I took like a 11 hour followed by a 14 hour flight. So hopefully you will also be strong and you will also be courageous to take that flight to come and meet me in Auckland. So uh, yeah, please take the brochure that I put on the, in the room and I'm happy to answer any questions. March. Uh, yeah, so uh, you said that uh, the, one of the challenges are the fluctuations, the speed and, uh, of the torque. Uh, but, but the life is not also that complicated. And so why uh, we just can't wait for the, uh, for the stable conditions or, or just to induce them? Uh, because the work of the, for example, during the process is not uh, very dynamic. It's, uh, this, this fault does not appear in a second. To so we can wait even a day or... Yeah, yeah. I, uh, we, we are not trying to do instantaneous thing. But uh, uh, this, these fluctuations are happening throughout. These are persistent uh, fluctuations. So like I described that uh, 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 the turbine is working uh, in this condition for a very long time. If you look at any portion of that time signal, you'll always see a similar fluctuation happening around the nominal uh, operating condition. And that's just because uh, the wind keeps on changing all the time. The, uh, uh, the controller keeps on taking different inputs. It has sensor noise that might get uh, uh, amplified because, because of the uh, improperly tuned uh, gains. So uh, uh, these fluctuations will continue to remain. Some, some small fluctuations will continue to remain uh, uh, throughout. But I'm not trying to say that we have to, we have to provide the fault information instantaneously. So you could, you could potentially, uh, in one hour, take a 10 second sample, uh, spend some time processing that, and then, uh, uh, then give the information, let's say, within an hour or within a day, and then uh, take action on that. Your answer would be yes, <laughs> but uh, the uh, information in, in real uh, systems are very limited usually. Uh, for example, in, in uh, ener energy industry, we have just an RMS of velocity in bearings, uh, etc. So, uh, how do you think? Uh, um, can you uh, imagine application of your methods in? Uh, predictive maintenance on such limited information. Yeah, yeah. yeah. so, uh, so uh, uh, I, I completely agree. There are some accelerometers which are uh, these days on the uh, energy industry. But uh, uh, this dynamic time warping is kind of, uh, uh, is in a way, uh, this dynamic time warping approach that I presented is uh, is motivated by the part that uh, uh, there are not many sensors available in the industrial machinery. So, so the other way to do this approach would be to get a speed reading from the encoder and then use that, uh, uh, use a speed reading in order to create a filter that will transform the measured signal into the angle domain and then you analyze the, uh, analyze the fault defects uh, in the angle domain. But the approach that I described over here is extracting the speed fluctuation information from the signal from the measured signal itself so so rather than using an accelerometer and the speed speed reading tachometer or uh, encoder reading i'm only relying on the accelerometer reading over here so in a way uh, this approach is motivated by the fact that we don't have that many sensors available in the in the industrial reading Okay, I have a question regarding to your way of computing residuals because you compare two signals from the healthy system, from, uh, from the faulty one, and you, uh, you, you are doing signal processing using DTW, and finally you get differences in residuals after DTW and without DTW. 
what are these residuals? How do you calculate yeah. them? Yeah. So uh, the residual is, uh, so, so basically what we do is, uh, uh, we, we, we came up with several publications in this area. The very first approach that we did, where we created a reference signal from the experimental measurement. So, so what we did was we, uh, we had a planetary gearbox which was running. We took a sense, we put the sensor on it, we had the measurement, we calculated what was the envelope uh, of that uh, signal, normalized it, and then created, based on the envelope, we created a reference assuming a constant speed uh, uh, for that uh, vibration signal. And that was what we assumed as a reference signal. Then we used, uh, then we took the measurement, and uh, this measurement, we basically took one data point. We calculated the least square analysis over the entire cycle. And wherever we got the le minimum least square, we aligned the two signals together in order to uh, fit the phase of them. After fitting the phase, this signal is describing without dynamic time warping what is the residual signal from uh, two, two, from the reference and the measurement uh, okay. uh, after the phase alignment, but not applying the dynamic time warping. The top, uh, the top plot is describing the residual signal from the healthy and the faulty uh, after using dynamic time warping. Uh, an interesting point that I want to point out over here is that uh, this uh, least square part that we did in order to align the two signals we actually Bartosz coded that program when we were doing oh, our I didn't PhD. Know about it. We were we were we were when we were doing PhD and we were doing the spectral analysis. We had for the for the last paper that we published together in University of Michigan, we had some cutting force cutting force model fitting, and in order to fit that cutting force model fitting, uh, we also did the least square analysis in order to align the model model data and the and the uh, 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 and the measurement. So, so there is a part of uh, uh, something I learned from Bartosz in that particular code. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Prosh. There's one question according to the time complexity which was shown on the plots. You said that the, the complexity of the algorithm was O n squared, if I remember well and it is going to be reduced to O n uh, using the recursive methods. Yeah. But yeah. the question is, uh, how did it happen? How was it reduced to the O of n? Yeah. Because if we are, if I remember well, of course, if we are just using the recursive programs, we are achieving something like O n log n or O log n, yes? Yeah, yeah so uh, uh, the way it works is that uh, we, uh, we recursively create a loop. So let's say uh, we sample uh, let's say we sample at uh, uh, 1024 for 10 seconds, okay? Now we end up getting 10,240 uh, samples. What we do is we keep on downsampling it to a certain threshold uh, till we find is okay. Uh, we find the warp path in that uh, uh, smallest downsampled value. So that uh, so this, this warp path is found in the smallest one and then just projected uh, one level up. So we basically each time downsample by half and then we just project it to uh, the double the number of time samples. Now we create a search window. Rather than building the entire cost matrix, we only search within this uh, 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 search window. Now it's not guaranteed that we will get the optimal path all the time. If we choose very, very small search window, uh, chances are we might have fluctuations outside it, or if we have a very wide search window, our com computation will increase. But yes, that is, the, that is something that we have to play around in order to uh, calibrate the algorithm. Any more questions? If not, I think it concludes our seminar. Thank you, Jasprit, for a very interesting seminar. It was, it was interesting. It was proven by this many, many questions from the audience. Thank you also those people who watch us on internet. And I hope we're going to have a very fruitful cooperation in the near future. Thank you once again. <laughs>